Hey everyone, in this video, we'll be discussing how Meta designed its build and distribution artifact storage layer called Delta to be simple, highly reliable, and strongly consistent. So Meta wanted to design a storage solution for its build and distribution storage layer. So whenever you build something, whenever you have a release, the storage layer that supports all of that is something that is a part of your mission critical infrastructure. So naturally, it had to be highly scalable, reliable, highly consistent, and also low dependency. So while you might be familiar with the above three, something like low dependency might be new to you. So whenever you're building something like a foundational infrastructure, you need it to depend on as little external factors as possible. So it should not depend on too many external services or too many things that are outside the purview of that one particular system. This makes it easier to bootstrap the service in case of a widespread outage. They are simpler to deploy and manage. There's a lesser chance of this main service failing in case there are some changes or updates to the systems it is dependent upon. So you want your foundational infrastructure to depend on as few external factors as possible. Therefore, you want them to be low dependency. Now, if you want something to be scalable and reliable, you will usually want it to be distributed. Right? So whenever something is distributed, you need consensus among its different nodes, right? When you have multiple replicas, they should all see a consistent view of the data that they are storing so that they can provide this consistent view to the clients. Usually you would have seen people or most companies go with quorum based consensus. That's because it works great for most of the use cases that you might have. So in case of a quorum based consensus, you usually have a leader node, which other nodes which are called replicas replicate data from. Whenever there is a write, the client will be writing its data to the leader. And when the leader receives this write, it propagates it to all its replicas. Once the leader receives an acknowledgement from the majority of its replicas, it considers that the update has been applied to the distributed system durably. So let's say you have four nodes here and three of them acknowledge this write. However, the fourth one was not able to get this right due to some external factor. Maybe it's a network partition, maybe it is slow or overloaded. So once the majority of the replicas have acknowledged this right, the leader will acknowledge the right back to the client. This means that the leader has told the client that I have stored your data successfully and now anyone else can query it, right? However, when the reads are being served, the reads can be served by any of the replicas in the distributed system, right? So it's possible that a client performs a read on the outdated replica that has not yet applied the latest update. In that case, it might not see this write that just happened and it might just not provide the latest view of the data back to the client that is querying it. And this is what we call eventual consistency. The distributed system will become consistent after a while. It will become consistent eventually However, there can be bits and pieces of time where all the nodes are not consistent in certain values. So this is something that you need to keep in mind. Secondly, in case the leader node goes down, one of the replicas must be promoted to become the new leader. This is usually done using a sophisticated leader election algorithm. Now in leader election, there's a sophisticated voting process that happens to make sure the node with the latest updates and the most consistent view of the data gets promoted to become the leader. Now, this process can be hard to follow, like monitor. It can be hard to predict, like which node will become the leader. And it is a little bit complicated. However, once the new leader has been elected, it can start accepting new rights. And also the replicas will start replicating data from this leader. And this works well for most of the distributed applications that are out there. However, Meta had two strong requirements. It wanted the system to be simple, which is sort of not the case when you have a very difficult to understand and predict leader election algorithm. And it also wanted the data store to be strongly consistent. This is where they went ahead with a rather unconventional approach. They went ahead with a replication strategy, which is called chain replication. In this strategy, the nodes are laid out in a linear manner, sort of like a linked list. The first node is called the head and the last node is called the tail. The head is the node that is responsible for receiving all the write requests. Once the head receives a write request, it persists that data into its storage and propagates it down the chain. 
The next node does the same and propagates it down. This happens until the update reaches the tail and the tail has successfully applied that update into its storage. Now the tail is responsible for acknowledging this write back to the client to tell it that the write was successful. So once this update has been applied to all the nodes, the tail acknowledges it. So the tail might directly contact the client or the tail might tell the head that it can now acknowledge this write back to the client. Whenever you want to read, the reads will always happen on the tail. So whatever data the tail returns will be guaranteed to have been persisted to every other node in the distributed system because of how the, the data is actually propagated. If some data is available at the tail, it is guaranteed to be present in every other node. Therefore, it is strongly consistent, right? Now, there are two problems with this approach. The first is the high write latency. In case of your quorum-based replication, the majority of the nodes were the minimum requirement to acknowledge a write, which means if you had, let's say, 60 nodes, even if 31 nodes had acknowledged the write, you would be able to return and acknowledge this write back to the client. However, in a chain replication-based system, you need every single node to have the copy of the data before you can acknowledge the write. Second, there is a bottleneck on the reads. Your tail is the uh, node that is serving all the reads. Therefore, it is sort of like a bottleneck. Since if you are facing a lot of read queries, you are constrained by the maximum number of requests that this one node can serve. Well, there is not much that we can do about the write latency. We can, however, optimize the read latency for our system using something called apportioned queries. Apportioned means to divide or to share out. In this case, our reads will be shared by all the other nodes in the system. Let's see how this works. In this strategy, each node in the chain can store multiple versions of an object, and each version includes a monotonically increasing version number. So you can see that uh, the key K has a couple of versions of the value associated with it. So the first version is called V1, and the second is called V2. So whenever the write request for a key initially comes in, its first version is always marked clean. So when the write request for k, comma v1 might have come in, all the write requests would have been, all the updates might have been marked as clean. So when we receive an update to a certain key, let's say we receive the second version uh, for the key k called as v2, we append this latest version to the version list for this object. If the node is not the tail node, we mark this version as dirty and propagate this write down to the successor. So we add this to the head's storage, we mark it as dirty, and we propagate it to the next node in the line. And we do this again. So if we propagate this update down to the tail, the tail will be the node that will be responsible for marking its own version as clean. And then once this is committed, the tail node can notify all the other nodes inside the system that it has applied the particular version to its storage. Therefore, it is able to serve those reads and the other nodes should mark their versions as clean. So once this acknowledgement is sent, the latest version is also marked as clean. So when the acknowledgement message for a particular version comes in, so let's say the tail node is able to apply the V2 update for an object the other nodes will discard all prior copies that existed before v2 from their storage just to save space so let's see how the read requests are now served let's consider this scenario now let's say we have the update v2 however it is only applied till the second node in the chain the tail has not yet received this update therefore this update is marked as dirty on whichever nodes it is present on so currently v2 is only propagated up till the second node and therefore, the head and the second node mark it as dirty. Let's say the second node receives the read request for the key K. If the latest known version of the key K would have been clean, we could have simply returned it because we would be sure that this version has been durably and consistently applied across the entire system. However, we see that the latest version that we have, which is V2, is marked as dirty since the tail has not yet acknowledged that it has received this right. Therefore, what we must do is we must consult the tail node about which version it has applied to its own storage and then return that version back to the client. 
So since we see that the V2 that we are storing here is marked as dirty, this node makes a request to the tail to check which version is the tail storing consistently. So the tail says that I have version one as the latest version for this key. Therefore, it returns the version number back to the node that was requesting it. And this node returns the version of the object associated with this version number back to the client. So since V2 was marked as dirty, we consulted the tail. The tail said that it has the latest update for V1 and it returned this version number. Therefore, we return the object associated with this version number, which is V1. And this is how you serve read requests. So once the tail is able to acknowledge V2, once, it, once this write propagates down, we will be able to mark this version as clean and subsequently delete all previous versions that we might be storing. Now the benefits of this strategy will depend on your read patterns. If you are querying very recently written data quite a few times, it's possible that your nodes might have to make queries to the tail to get the latest version if that version that is being queried is dirty. However, if you are querying old data or some data that is not very recently written, this uh, technique will scale out quite well because your nodes will be able to serve all those reads independently. Now let's come to Delta. Delta's architecture consists of this concept of buckets, where each bucket could potentially belong to one customer. Each of these buckets can include several chains and each of these chains can include four or more servers. Now each chain in this bucket can be considered like a logical or a data shard, which serves part of your data or part of your traffic. And servers in a particular chain are spread across different failure domains to maximize reliability. Uh, spreading across different failure domains sort of means that the first and the second uh, nodes in this chain will probably not be using the same network, will probably not be using the same power source. Therefore, they will be maximizing for reliability. So even if the power source completely goes out for the first node, you should be able to reliably fall back on the second node without much problem. So you don't lose uh, the entire chain just because the power went out in a certain uh, power source. So when clients want to access some object in this one bucket, they can use a consistent hash of the object name to decide which uh, chain they should be uh, consulting to read that data. So now your clients must know which host they want to query, right? So this metadata called the bucket config metadata is stored in one external service, which is built on top of Zookeeper. This is the only external dependency of Delta, uh, therefore keeping it low dependency. And uh, this Zookeeper instance, or which is a, obviously a distributed replicated instance, will store your bucket configs. So the clients will depend on this config to determine which host they want to make requests to so in case they want to make a write request, they'll get the address of the head. If they want to make a read request, they'll get the address of a tail. And since uh, Delta uses a portion queries, it's not necessary that the reads will get back the address of the tail. How uh, they can even be consulting other nodes in this uh, system as we discussed previously. So coming to the failure detection and recovery, interestingly, the failure detection and recovery processes in the original chain replication paper were offloaded to a separate service. However, what Meta was able to do was it was able to integrate the failure detection part inside the chain itself, while recovery was offloaded to a separate component inside the Delta bucket. For failure detection, you need to be able to tell if a node has gone bad. So let's take this example. Let's say in chain one, we have link three, which has become unavailable. The best way to mark this to detect that this node is unavailable is to probably depend on its peers in the chain that is uh, that it's present in. So since link two and li uh, the tail would probably be in the most contact with link three, since link two will be sending some data to link three and ta the tail will be depending on to get some data from link three, it's easy for both these nodes to detect if this particular node becomes unavailable. So they wait for these two nodes to mark the unavailable host as suspicious since this node is not now, now not available. This marking and this detection is monitored by this component called the ring master, which is part of the chain replication strategy. So the ring master is sort of like their control plane service, an automated control plane service, which will notice this and remove the link three from this chain. So what it will do is it will remove link three, try to repair it, and then if it is successful in repairing it, it adds it back 
into the tail of the chain. So what we see here is link 2 is now connected to the tail since link 3 was removed. Once it was repaired, it was added to the back of the tail. We'll always prefer repairing a host rather than commissioning a new one since the previous uh, currently unavailable host would have most of the data that is supposed to be there on this node and commissioning a fresh host will require us to sync a lot more data compared to simply bringing this old one, old one back up. So we will always prefer trying to repair the previous host instead of commissioning a new one. So what happens when we add this link 3 to the back of the currently existing chain? The first thing it does, it starts syncing up to the updates that it might have missed over the period it was unavailable. So it syncs back and gets all the writes that it had missed. While this link 3 is syncing, it will not serve any reads since it does not yet have a consistent view of the data. The reads will still be served by the previous tail of your chain. So you see that the reads are coming to the uh, tail and it's also sending back the replies. However, it can still get the new write updates. If there are some new writes happening, it can still uh, continue to receive them. And once the link 3 that is now repaired has caught up, it will now be marked as a tail and will now be capable of uh, committing as well as uh, serving reads. So coming to global replication, a foundational storage service needs to be globally replicated to make it reliable. In V1 of the service, if a client wanted to store a blob in multiple regions, uh, let's say for safety considerations, they had to make separate requests to store this data to each of these regions. However, that is obviously not ideal. What you would want is that you should not have to worry about where your data is present. Instead, you should just be able to make a request to your object store and the object store should worry about where it replicates and how it replicates the data. So after the initial release, they added something called a global replicator. This replicator is responsible for making sure that some write that is made in a particular region is replicated across the different data centers and the different regions that are present. Now some of this replication will happen synchronously and some will happen asynchronously. What this means is that if you get a write request, you will synchronously sync this write request to a minimum set of regions that you have decided while the other regions will receive it asynchronously. So what this means is that once the region A and region B receive the write, we will be able to acknowledge this write back to the client. And the replication to region C and region D, which might not be your minim inside your minimum set of replication regions, these regions will re re uh, receive this write uh, asynchronously in the background. Therefore, you don't need to wait for the write to propagate across the entire globe before you are able to acknowledge it you only replicate it to a minimum set of regions and then you're able to send back the acknowledgement. So that's how Delta works. Meta made this unusual choice of going with a chain replication strategy instead of a quorum based replication strategy while suffering from high latencies, but at least guaranteeing strong consistency and high reliability because of simplicity of the system. So it's a trade off. They traded off latency for simplicity and strong consistency. And that does it for this video. Be sure to subscribe to my newsletter since the newsletter readers received this issue about Delta before the video came out. And subscribe to my channel for more future content. And I'll see you in the next one.